Hi, I'm the other speaker. Hi. Hi. I met you before, right? In the Yeah. Yes, Last year, yes, yeah, yes, we had a yes. short conversation. Yes, 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 yes. Hi, I'm sorry, hi. I think that they don't want us to be together. No, they're that's just going to take yeah. each session yes. at a time. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So once they figure out this, and I'm running yeah. to... And I'm going to change to um, my own machine. And it's good because I'm last. Because? You're I'm, last. I'm last. Oh, and okay. then we don't have to do it in between. So you're going to put... Um, my Mac into there because uh, clips I just don't trust it on a stick. Oh my god, but this is quite transparent. I like sitting behind a table where uh, seamless. now you have to think about how you're standing. Um, I thought there wasn't any room for QA, there now. So, why I don't think I think it's just the names are there in the seats. No idea for the video. I think so. Um, well, good luck. I'll um, give you the stage. Thank you. <laughs> so, what do you want me to do with this mic? I don't know what the hell is happening here. The guy's coming in. Oh, so okay. Because uh, otherwise, they'll have to just like stand oh, here. Guess, can I just like it is working? Now. But can I just take it out? Because no. otherwise, this is just I'll have to. All right. So, this is good.
bicycle and Since we don't have a moderator here, I will explain that we are need, that we need to reinstall a camera here, and this is actually a session with no moderation and uh, with no Q and A, right? And so I think that we'll just go one after the other, and these sessions will be recorded and uploaded. So once camera is ready, we will start, and then. Um, I think that if people have questions, we were instructed to get these outside the room so that the recording can continue. And so that would, uh, since I'm going first, <laughs> I'll be happy to uh, discuss, and but we'll do it uh, outside so we do not interrupt the recording of the next session. All right, so good morning again with one camera on. We're going to start. My name is Niva Elkin Koren uh, from the University of Haifa. I'm a law professor uh, and the director of the Haifa Center for Law and Technology. And I've been uh, thinking about algorithmic enforcement over the past um, couple of years, focusing uh, particularly on the way in which we can address algorithmic enforcement, what is actually happening behind the scene of the algorithms uh, that are actually taking down some of these uh, materials that are posted by uh, users, and, and how we can address in this type of environment uh, the interests of uh, users and the public interest in uh, access to knowledge. And i like to uh, talk a little bit uh, on these issues within the context of uh, the controversial Article 13 that is being uh, now uh, discussed in uh, uh, Europe, uh, where uh, a new duty to filter is uh, introduced. Um, uh, to uh, be imposed on online service providers uh, to undertake measures that would enable the identification and prevention of the upload of infringing uh, materials. So, um, in fact, um, online service providers have been uh, working over the past two decades under the regime of the notice and takedown, first under the uh, DMCA that was adopted here in the United States in 1998, and then from uh, 2000 uh, uh, in, in Europe under the European uh, e-commerce directive. Under the notice and takedown uh, regime, online service providers are requested to uh, expeditiously remove uh, allegedly infringing materials after they receive a notice, after they become aware of uh, those infringing uh, materials. But in fact, this notice and takedown regime has turned into uh, an algorithmic enforcement regime. So there is no little person that is writing a notice and sending it, but a robot that is searching the net, sending a robot notice to uh, one of these online service providers, and those service providers are um, um, automatically removing these materials. And some of these online service providers have actually turned this uh, into a business model, where you have uh, what was called in the literature the DMCA Plus, 
uh, services such as uh, filtering and blocking ahead of time, right? Before the materials are even up, uploaded, uh, uh, some are offering monetization of allegedly infringing materials at the request of the right holders. Uh, take down and stay down, meaning that once uh, uh, materials were taken down, you can search for the materials in case that they're being uploaded uh, again. And overall, what we see is private ordering that is automated in this uh, regime, not only in terms of the algorithmic enforcement of uh, copyright, but I think more interesting uh, aspect of it is a privatization of norm making. When you come to think about it, Online service providers applying algorithmic enforcement are not only uh, applying the law, but actually defining the law, right? Because once you have to apply an algorithm that would detect infringing materials, you have to make decisions about what is infringement, right? Whether it's one second of copying, three seconds, five, 15, or the entire work, right? So these are substantive decisions that are made by uh, uh, online service providers under uh, under the automated notice uh, and takedown. And so we've had uh, quite a lot of experience uh, uh, and, and, and a few studies looking in, you know, behind the veil of algorithms, what is actually happening there. And, and some of the empirical studies, some of which uh, I uh, personally engaged in, but uh, a lot of others coming from Creating Glasgow and also uh, from uh, Berkeley, are showing that uh, in many cases these algorithms make error, right? They uh, uh, confuse one right holder to another. They confuse between, um, um, they make mistakes in, a, in identification of a particular work. They give, uh, they discriminate. Uh, in some cases, it would give a priority uh, removal service to uh, some uh, partners, uh, um, business partners of the online service provider, uh, and would neglect the enforcement of copyright by uh, individual authors. Um, what is more uh, of a concern is the way in which algorithmic enforcement actually supersedes the public ordering. So if we think that there are definitions of what is substantial similarity in law, or what is fair use, or what is subject to limitation and exceptions, we'll see many cases in which uh, uh, works that are allegedly infringing are actually uh, reflecting a legitimate use. And finally, in many cases, algorithmic enforcement was actually used in order to silence legitimate speech. Uh, in fact, in the United States, since online service providers um, are subject to uh, Section uh, 230, they do not have any obligation to remove any content for any other reason rather than copyright law. So that has become the only way of removing anything that you find objectionable. And so um, uh, with this in mind, we have to look at the way in which we can counterbalance this algorithmic uh, enforcement regime, and limitation and exceptions have very limited effect. And the reason is that limitation and exceptions of all sorts uh, can only be invoked in litigation. So in litigation, uh, um, we, uh, we can uh, argue that uh, we have a legitimate use, but this would be ineffective for prior removal, for private removal, for instance, by systems such as content ID, and of course for other restrictions in the uh, year law, the terms of use. So the question is basically how do we tilt back the balance uh, uh, in copyright uh, that need to balance remuneration for authors and access to the public and to future creators that could take advantage of uh, pre-existing works in order to create under, under um, um, legitimate uh, use. And my proposal here is to uh, address 
uh, this problem by designing the limitation and exceptions uh, into the removal system. So basically the idea is to contest the algorithms with algorithms. So if we have algorithmic enforcement that is identifying infringement, we can also develop tools that would identify legitimate use and when it's uh, very likely, like 80%, 90%, 95%, uh, to be legitimate use, uh, these would have to be uh, uh, remain online. And where is, uh, there is doubt, we will uh, um, be able to uh, forward this to some human review. Now, of course, the biggest challenge is how do we deal with open standards, such as fair use. And here, I mean, open standards, I mean, you know, um, uh, fair dealing would be open, uh, but fair use would be uh, uh, the 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 most uh, flexible norm, where the court would retroactively have to uh, consider these four factors: the purpose of the use, the nature of the copyrighted work, the amount that has been taken, and the effect on the market. And the idea here is to take advantage of. Uh, the, of, of machine learning that enable us to predict the judicial outcome. So as input, what we're going to use is court decision, briefs, um, um, the factual data that is involved. And some of the choices may be, sometimes may be, maybe even made by this community, about what is legit legitimate use. Uh, then an algorithm would be able to, you know, would be trained by using this data either by um, supervised training, using some of the factors that were identified as, uh, you know, by uh, previous empirical research, or simply allowing the algorithm to run through examples of what was considered legitimate use by the court, and and training the algorithm to distinguish between legitimate and infringing uh, use of copyrighted materials. And the outp output of these systems would be uh, to predict what the court would decide. In, in this way, um, we actually take advantage of, the, uh, of, of, of some of the uh, new capabilities of algorithms in uh, learning and predicting, and it turned out that uh, as you can see in this uh, um, research that was recently published in the Science Magazine, that uh, um, algorithms can predict the outcome of uh, uh, decisions by court uh, more accurately than um, experts. Um, some of the challenges that we are facing is, first of all, data. Training data. Where do we get training data? We don't have enough decisions related to fair use. You know, decided cases where there are there is fair use in order to use it for training the machines. And I think that one of the challenges that we can consider in this Congress is maybe using some of the knowledge of law or choices made by librarians or made by uh, parodists or made by documentary filmmakers in the practices in order to help us train uh, the algorithm and then fix it, right? Tweak it according to some of the court um, uh, decisions. Another important challenge is policy challenge. And, and of course, I think here, um, uh, you know, when we think about developing a system that is uh, um, w w with the public interest uh, in mind, uh, we need to think how to how we can uh, promote a market that would uh, generate these type of uh, tools. And here, I think that our best bet would be to advocate uh, a duty on right holders to consider li um, um, limitation and exceptions prior to the removal of allegedly infringing materials. That would take care of the market because then they're going to have incentives in uh, investing in uh, the development of such tools. 
I think that uh, the second challenge would be how to ensure compliance with the rule of law. And here, I think that some of the experience that we had in the notice and takedown was such that uh, even though users that their content was removed had a right under the DMCA to counter uh, the, the notification of infringement, uh, almost none have used that right. And so I think that we should think about uh, stronger incentives uh, for, sh for challenging this system in the court. Maybe right holders are under a duty to consider limitation and exceptions, and they will run a program that doesn't really consider limitation and exception, or does it wrong? Unless we have incentives for people to bring these lawsuits to the court and have the court look at it, uh, we haven't done uh, enough. And here I think we should think about class actions, statutory damages, and, the, and, and that could be the, the way to move forward with, with this um, uh, duty of right holders to consider fair use. Finally, courts would have to develop new measures for judicial review, either ex ante, like certification of programs, or ex post, such as looking at this error rate of these uh, uh, programs, uh, what is reasonable, what is uh, proportional, uh, and um, uh, etc. So when we look at this brave new world uh, of uh, legal tools, uh, lots of opportunities are opening up. Uh, we can have it both ways, right? We can have adjudication by the court and prediction by machine learning. That maybe will enable us uh, in copyright law to bridge an important gap that we have in limitation and exceptions between open standards and st strict rules, right? And so we talk a lot about the question of what works best for users' rights, open standards or strict rules, and here we can have both and Joe both, both words, worlds, right? We can have more predictable uh, standards that with the assistance of machine learning that would help us predict. At the same time, uh, we're gonna have uh, more uh, um, um, a system that is more uh, flexible than rules because we are going to keep the role of the court in deciding uh, new and more challenging cases. So this is my proposal in uh, 10 minutes. If we can't uh, fight the duty to filter, let us have it subject to a duty on the right holders to consider limitation and exceptions and hope that they will implement this algorithmically. Thank you. Do you think it's no, not really uh, that loud. I don't want to be screaming in people's. Uh, yeah, I don't know if my computer will turn on. Then I would also know what I'm saying.
Kavadiyatu Ambitsuna Nalakalina Okay, uh, just one second. Uh, I'm just trying to shut off my computer because I keep giving you my number. And nothing will happen. Okay, I think uh, I'm going to stop you from continuing with your break. So um, this isn't my slide and this isn't my work, but uh, in the spirit of this conference, I'm going to just steal this, uh, talk about it as my own, but it isn't. My name is Mishi Chaudhary. I'm the legal director of Software Freedom Law Center. I'm a lawyer. I practice in New York and uh, New Delhi. Um, I also found a digital services organization called sflc.in, it's based out of India. I'm supposed to be talking about algorithmic transparency today. Um, we have begun collecting all human behavior and we have begun putting the machine in between human beings in every transaction in life. In doing that, we are increasingly operating society on a new basis. Operating with a new form of social science that we don't understand yet, but which we are already using in much the same way that physics was used to change European societies in the 17th and the 18th century, producing an industrial revolution that people didn't really understand yet. But they had new science, and they used it. We are now using the phrase artificial intelligence and the phrase machine learning to mean pattern matching and pattern finding in immense quantities of human behavior data. I have been asked to talk about algorithmic transparency, a phrase I personally think is misleading, um, aspirational, and a variety of ways, and I'll explore why I think so. And uh, without going too much into the details, I want to talk about a larger idea around this. We are now using this, whatever we are calling algorithms or artificial intelligence, to control the market. Um, we control the market by changing advertising into a system of uh, anticipating wants and intervening in the near term to amplify some wants and reduce the others. This is having the consequence that our understanding of democratic politics is no longer accurate, and things are changing in an out-of-control way. You're in the right city to actually understand what the tech is actually doing for the people. People like us who were told that uh, they were taking back control by having these wonderful devices in their hands are beginning to feel that they're not in control, that they are being controlled here. From small but distressing instances, like um, the wonderful Amazon algorithm, which um, compiles frequently bought together items when you're buying a nail paint, it also says, why don't you buy a nail polish remover? That thing. Um, those frequently bought recommendations that just five days after a subway explosion in London last year suggested to British shoppers some bomb ingredients while perusing the site for groceries and other accessories. The same algorithms earlier that year um, had made bomb making books on offer after a terrorist attack in Manchester. Now, to larger, more life-impacting work, like jobs, credit rating, or as Julie Angwin's work shows us, 
sentencing or parole. Everybody wants to understand what these algorithms are and what they are doing to us, either from an exploitation, which is the markets, um, how do we use this for social science? Or from a rights-based perspective, where we want to do this for information justice, um, how do we protect people from this new social science which is developing? Or from a political point of view, how do we perfect a social control, either in a large-scale form, like the Chinese Communist Party, or a small-scale form, like Google or Facebook, which have managed to revolutionize the advertising system to their advantage in a very short time. Algorithmic transparency is a phrase that we now use to express the desire for reduction of inequality between the human being and the machine. If only we knew what it, this machine, was doing, we somehow believe we would be more an open source software movement who have spent more than a generation feeling that political liberty hinged on technological freedom, that people had control over their divine consequences that we are of now. For those of us who this, this seems like a totally natural conclusion. That's why we hack the copyright law for sharing rather than just keeping it to ourselves. Unfortunately, it's completely false. In order to understand why it's completely false, we need to understand what we mean by this. Apparently, what we mean is that show us the algorithm at the level at which we are talking about the systems that determine who should go to jail, for how long, um, who should get what parole, how to predict who's driving drunk so you can stop them, or how to figure out which Uyghurs have religious opinions. Knowing the rules of this analysis, we are told, if somebody went and told us what this algorithm looks like and what are the rules of this analysis about how a particular ad is targeted at us or a video is shown to us, will somehow restore control or freedom. As I said, this is completely false because the algorithm isn't what it really matters. The algorithm is usually very simple. It's only a set of instructions. If you practice in US patent law, it's easy for you to know the carve outs. If you're in your Europe, you know it. If you're talking about 3K in India, you are already aware of it. This algorithm is very, very simple and does not really matter. What really does matter is show us the data and then we will know what is really going on. Algorithmic transparency is an attempt to give specificity to our concern, but a very deceptive attempt. It's a name that is too clear and too precise to be correct, and it distracts our attention from what we are really talking about, which is knowledge based on the collection of behavior and ultimately based on the collection of genetic information. That's what precision medicine is all about. Nobody talks about it in these terms because capitalism and despotism and all other forms of power in the human race are being restructured in terms of who controls the data. You've heard the trite uh, adage about data is the new whatever, oil, petroleum, fill in whatever word appeals to you. Nor do simplistic answers like people should be the owners of their own data help either. Because the subject is the inferences from the data. And those inferences then themselves, themselves become the data, which are then again operated upon by more inferences. We are really talking about this vast accumulation of unequal knowledge between players, where knowledge about this behavior is power. Currently, it is concentrated. Therefore, concentration is our problem not obscurity of the algorithms which talk about this. When Sandy Pentland of MIT talks of this as social physics, it is this point he's pressing upon. By using the data to build a predictive computational theory of human behavior, we can hope to engineer better social systems. There is now at least ample evidence that computational analysis of fine-grained data sets can shed light on socioeconomic outcomes. 
processes at levels of granularities and degrees of complexities that have never been seen before. And they can inform better decisions to fight poverty, inequality, diseases, crime, urban congestion, and a bunch of other things. But there are no systems and standards developed to do this at scale, ethically, with privacy respecting algorithms. That is why efforts like the Open Algorithms Project, where the goal is to create a hub of anonymized data to which everyone from telecom providers to major banks can contribute, are the way to go. And then the users themselves can take advantage of visual tools to connect relevant data sets in ways that satisfy their individual needs and wants. Now, this is the privacy preserving tech with participatory governance system with an ethical oversight board, which teaches us to talk about data the same way now we talk about algebra and science, which seemed pretty daunting a few hundred years ago. We're always trying to understand the sources of power in the physical environment in order to understand the shape of power in the social environment, in order to understand what the law should be. This time, it's a little different because we're not generating energy from combustion engines. We are actually relying on knowledge. And what do we know about people? In that process, we are also discovering that inequality of this knowledge is source of power in the market, in the government, and in the politics. That's where algorithmic transparency is about algorithms, which is not really the right thing because the data matters so much. And those in whose hands all this power is concentrated are the ones who want to now say that let us own the algorithms. We could tell you about the software, that, but then we will not tell you about what the data itself is. It's basically saying let's refashion the intellectual property laws so that we can own the algorithms, which have traditionally been carve outs from the ownership of ideas in all the systems as we all know. And then we will suddenly allow people to own. This is misrepresentation of technology, as though showing the code is all that would matter. I want to say it's an aspirational statement, an aspirational statement of algorithmic transparency, which actually should be talking about data democracy or, and, and accountability. It's an aspiration for a world where people can understand what is happening to them. And here is the bad news. We are moving at internet speed to a world that we know we do not understand, and in which power is extraordinarily correlated with vast amounts of information we are letting people collect about ourselves, and we don't know how to fashion these rules. All these little granular things which we thought worked in the 20th century are not going to work here, because as we saw, machines are going to replace us also. The legal judgment is not going to be as important. That's why the rules also will have to be moving at a very different speed. This is why self-explainable AI, notice of AI, an opportunity to be heard where there is such decision making, whether AI is mixed with humans or not, is what we want to talk about. It is where we are told where the hot spots are, where the government is using certain things about us. Send the algorithms to the data, not the other way around. Make them open, decentralize and democratize. Make the decision makers accountable and start doodling with new business ideas while looking at some kind of due process. Not limited in GDPR ways or IP ways, but a much larger way. The industry, don't worry about them, they will settle because disruption is their mantra. Data democracy and accountability is what we need, not just algorithmic transparency. Thank you.
Can I just start? Yeah? I don't know if we're waiting for Andres to come back, but. No, okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just want to say hello to my colleague, Marcella, who's watching live in the UK. So I don't know where to, but I think she's over there. Um, my talk today is called uh, Raiding the Icebox, Film Archival Access, Found Footage Filmmaking, and the Fair Dealing Debate. Uh, my name is uh, Claudia Obdenkamp. I'm a lecturer in film and a faculty member at the Center for Intellectual Property Policy and Management uh, at Bournemouth University in the UK. And I'm also an adjunct research fellow at Swinburne Law School in Melbourne, Australia. Sorry, this is dangerous. Okay. Oh, it's, it's fine like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> I'd like to um, introduce you to Charlie Lyne. Uh, he's a young UK filmmaker. Uh, the first time I heard of him was when a friend of mine sent me a link to his Kickstarter campaign in January 2016. I was familiar at the time with uh, This Film Is Not Yet Rated, which is a documentary that examines the film rating system of the Motion Picture uh, Association of America, the MPA MPAA. And that film became the poster child for fair use in filmmaking with its more than 100 unlicensed clips from Hollywood and other more independent films. It looked like Charlie's attempt was to take on its UK equivalent, the BBFC, the British Board of Film Classification. A film cannot be released in British cinemas without a BBFC certificate. And the fee of that certificate is calculated by the minute and costs around a thousand pounds for a feature film of average length. For many independent filmmakers, such a large upfront is uh, prohibitively expensive. So Charlie decided to make a film called Pain Drying, which was exactly that, a single unbroken shot of white paint drying on a brick wall. And what he was asking for in his Kickstarter campaign was a contribution to his film so that he could make it as long as possible. Charlie had namely discovered uh, an interesting flip side to all of this. Uh, while filmmakers are required to pay the BBFC to certify their work, the BBFC is required to sit through everything you make in cinema conditions. So his campaign was very successful, and the final film was 10 hours and 7 minutes long. And the film was watched in two-person, hour-long shifts to make sure that nothing explicit was hidden in the film. And there wasn't. It is no surprise that the film got a rating of U, which means the film contains no material likely to offend or harm. And Charlie Twitter, this was £5,936 well spent. Um, because of my own interest and research in found footage filmmaking, I then very quickly became familiar with his other work, his essay filmmaking. And essay filmmaking typically means working with existing material in order to advance a new story. In the last few years, he's been making all of his work under copyright exceptions. And under these exceptions, it is possible under certain circumstances and for certain specific purposes to use copyright protected works without permission from the copyright owner. And in Charlie's case, these have been mainly the ones on criticism and review, and since 2014, the very important addition of the exception for a quotation. Uh, this quotation exception is the first ever exception in the UK law that uh, is not linked to a specific purpose, and this has substantially expanded the range of covered uses in the law, and it has moved fair dealing interpretation uh, more in the direction of fair use. And what's remarkable in Charlie's work is he doesn't experience copyright as an impediment. He rather embraces the freedom it provides him. Or in his own words, you're in a good place from a fair dealing perspective uh, when your artistic impulses are aligned closely enough with your legal necessity that they're not in contradiction. 
And this is really interesting in the historical tradition of this kind of filmmaking, uh, because in the last few years, what we can see is this tremendous shift in the creative process. Lawyers and filmmakers now work in tandem to ensure that the work is copyright compliant. And so the legal environment has actively become part of the creative environment. And this hasn't been seen before. Um, traditionally, found footage films have been concerned with showcasing the potential of films that have fallen from the mainstream, the so-called leftovers. And sometimes, quite literally, as filmmakers obtained their material from flea markets or dumpsters outside of film laboratories. And copyright was just not an issue. It, it just wasn't considered. And if anything, filmmakers ignored or actively positioned themselves against the constraints of copyright law. And what we've also seen over those same last few decades, moving into a more digital realm, is, of course, also a tremendous shift in aesthetics. Um, I'll take you through a few examples, which I've chosen because they reuse very big canonical A titles, which were produced by a variety of studios. This is Charlie's short video from 2010 called Death Hitchcock. And the concept was death scenes from 36 different Hitchcock films synchronized so that the moment of death happens at exactly the same moment. Uh, a very famous and oft quoted so-called pre-digital found footage film that reuses Hitchcock material is Home Stories by Matthias Müller from 1990. Müller used a 16 millimeter film camera to shoot this footage directly from a television screen in order to compile his film. There are a few reasons why the filmmaker could have favored this mode of production. So on the one hand, as you can see, it creates a very particular visual effect. But on the other hand, it is also a method of circumventing the need to secure permission to reuse the film material. But no matter the motivation, the slightly degraded appearance of the material is a direct result of the manner in which this material was accessed. And another example is uh, Thomas Anderson's film, Los Angeles Plays Itself, this is 2003, a video essay about the history of that city's portrayal in film. Tom Anderson compiled low resolution video at the time as he was unable to obtain formal permission uh, from the studios to reuse the Hollywood narrative film material. So here we go, 1990, 2003, and 2010. This is what uh, Professor of Film and Media Studies, Lucas Hildebrand, calls the aesthetics of access in his 2009 publication, Inherent Vice. And I find this um, a very um, useful term uh, because it encompasses the provenance of the material, uh, which includes uh, its legal provenance. It also encompasses the, the techniques of circumvention used to obtain the material, and all of these elements can then be traced in the film's aesthetics. Now, these practices all took place outside of the confines of the institutional film archive. And how else could they not? Archives would very likely not have been able to provide the source material. Uh, these institutions have their own rights issues and perceived rules to adhere to, and they deal with sensitive relationships with existing and future donors. They also deal with privacy and ethical issues in regards to certain collections, such as medical film collections, for instance. And what public archives practice can be defined as chief curator of the iFilm Institute in Amsterdam, Giovanna Fossati has termed it, a chaperone model. So the archival films are brought to the public um, with the archives acting as a chaperone to show the way. They contextualize the films historically and aesthetically and at the same time attempt to protect the films uh, as well as their content. So large scale digitization projects of uh, film collections have been extensively discussed in the last two decades by many archive and some of them are uh, ongoing. But archivists are still struggling with, ooh, wow, sorry, <laughs> what happened? 
um, archivists are uh, still struggling with uh, questions regarding the kinds of, of access that should be granted to their users once the content is available digitally. And so the question is whether film archives will move on from this chaperone model. Will they be able to let go of their collections and acknowledge uh, the new role of the users? But letting go of collections, um, allowing users to explore these digital repositories without a chaperone uh, does, of course, not mean that the archive is now completely open. Um, it also doesn't mean that the traditional role of the archivist as a human gatekeeper has disappeared. These new archives may be performative, but the archivists are still the editors of knowledge, as Professor Julia Nordegraaf has termed it. And it's worth stating that much creative expression still depends on gatekeeper control. Archives don't have to provide filmmakers with material, but if they don't, filmmakers will be forced to look for alternative footage or alternative ways to obtain it. And this leads to what Pat Aufdeide and Peter Yazi in their Reclaiming Fair Use have so beautifully termed silent erasures. Uh, and as we observe a growing community of legal compliant filmmaking, it might be worth rethinking the role of this kind of filmmaking. Because traditionally, it was at least partially to provoke and to push boundaries, be they legal or aesthetic. And where this kind of filmmaking sometimes used, uh, used to highlight the, the, the latent potential of the archive, this role is now also shifting. So the world outside the archive, where filmmakers have already access to the necessary material, is changing drastically fast. And it's those practices outside of the archives that have put and are putting the very concept of the archive um, under pressure. And now that they're in the process of letting go of their collections, we need to enter into a dialogue with these rather risk-averse um, gatekeepers. The newly proposed text for the Directive of Copyright in the Digital Single Market would open up archives extensively. If archives would indeed be allowed to digitize and disseminate online out-of-commerce works, as is proposed, that could lead to a revolutionary shift in archival access. Uh, for now, that um, remains to be seen. Um, but my point is fair dealing is an extremely useful concept uh, for certain filmmakers, but only if you have access to high quality reproducible source material. So I'd like to uh, wrap up and leave you with the thought that archives and archivists can help push that envelope, but that fair dealing needs fair access. Thank you very much. Yeah, so it's uh, it's oh, on that machine. Yeah. Yeah. They said that there was a link. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, it, but it's really funny because I sing yeah. the room. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you're also trying to read the title of the yeah. I know, it's so funny. Oh, yeah, it was.
Thanks a lot, Chris. Hey, we're gonna get started. So I'm, I'm Robert Weissman with Public Citizen. This is a panel discussion on, if I gotta hold it. What do you want, Virgie? Like this, is that better? Although you can hear me without it. Uh, we're gonna have what was framed as a debate, and it's gonna be a debate slash panel discussion on the right to be forgotten. Um, I don't know if any of you in the, how many of you in the room are Americans. I think most of the Americans are transfixed by the, the, the hearing outside, which is where I think all of us would like to be too. Um, it's just a, this is an important moment in, a, in American history. Um, and uh, we have an important topic for in here. It's not unrelated to what's going on out there, um, but I think it'd be sort of stupid not to acknowledge what's happening. And uh, in particularly the sort of rawness of this, of this moment, especially for, for really everybody who's kind of conscious, but particularly for women. So let's put that out there. We were going to ha uh, have a four people on this panel. Uh, Mark Rotenberg from Epic is not able to join us, so we're now with three. Um, we have Anna Fielder from Privacy International, where she's Chair Emeritus, and from the Transatlantic Consumer Dialogue. Paul Levy, who is an attorney in my organization, Public Citizen, and Jamie Love, who is the Director of Knowledge Ecology International. Um, with, this is gonna be, the reason I say it's gonna be sort of a debate slash panel discussion, I think you'll see, partly we're gonna debate even what the terms are of what we're debating uh, and what we should be calling it. That said, more or less, Anna is gonna be for the right to be forgotten, although she's gonna deny it should be called the right to be forgotten, if I understand her position correctly. Uh, and Paul and Jamie are gonna be opposed. Mark would have been on Anna's team. So we're gonna give Anna extra time. Uh, Anna will go first, Paul and Jamie will follow, and Anna will um, come afterwards. We're not gonna be too uh, strict on time. They're all supposed to do seven and a half minutes, although Paul's already told me he's planning to do 10. And uh, we'll have a little bit of discussion afterwards that I will moderate, and then we'll open it up for for your conversation. This was, um, because it is a big topic and one where there's internal debate in our community, it was structured to be longer than most of these sessions. We have 90 minutes for this, so we're not gonna run out of time. Um, and all of you are gonna have a chance to, to weigh in um, as you like. Uh, I will tell you for whatever it's worth, and I'm about to get out of the way, that although I am a usually um, someone known for strong opinions, I'm actually not sure where I come down in this one. So I'm, and I'm also able to, these three, three people are all my friends, they have very strong opinions. Um, but I'll keep them under control in a neutral way because they're just my friends and I, but I don't have an opinion on it. Um, with that said, let me get out of the way. Anna's gonna start. Anna, I think, is the only one with a, a PowerPoint presentation, so she'll run through that. Paul and Jamie will go, and then Anna will have any final remarks she wants to make before we have a, a moderated conversation. Anna, you're up. Well, thank you very much for this uh, lovely introduction. Um, yes, I'm for the right to be forgotten, although I don't think it should be called the right to be forgotten. And I very much regret Mark is not here with me because I'm a European, although I, in the transatlantic consumer dialogue, I stride both sides. But <laughs> and these are friends, by the way. You know, we are all on the same team, except that we don't agree on this particular issue. Um, I'm going to demonstrate to you that what's happening out there, as Rob has started, is actually not going to be affected by the right to the, be forgotten. Absolutely clearly, from my point of view, and I hope the lawyers in this room that know the law will support me on that. I see the lady in red nodding and I hope you support me. Can I ask you first before I start, how many of you know the actual legislation that we are talking about? Can you uh, put up your hands? Oh, there's quite a lot of people, but quite a, few, quite a few of you don't. So what I want to do, I'm not having a PowerPoint presentation. I just put the relevant article of the 
GDPR up on the screen. And uh, as you can see on the first slide, uh, it's, it's simply a right to delete information that is no longer relevant, out of date, um, it doesn't mean anything. So it, it's called a right to erasure, a right to delete. And I don't think uh, many of us are against that. Uh, our US colleagues wouldn't be against that either. In fact, the Transatlantic Consumer Dialogue has put out a public letter supporting, in effect, the, the basic rights. Uh, the controversy starts with the second part, um, which is about what has been uh, labelled uh, the so-called the right to be forgotten, whereby uh, the entity, business, public body, whoever holds your information, has a duty to inform to the best of their ability uh, other entities with whom they shared the information. So um, we're not talking here about necessarily about Google or search engines or whatever. We're talking, let's say, you want to delete your uh, information from Facebook because you are no longer there and you want a, a sort of reasonable try for the company to inform the others whom they either con contractually or in other ways have shared your information with. And that would apply to your bank, insurance company, whatever. So, so it's a general best of your effort to notify your subcontractors that this data has been deleted. And it's actually linked to another article, which is Article 19, that gives an obligation on companies com called controllers to notify others that with whom they shared the data to delete this data because it's no longer relevant. Okay, finally, really important uh, is paragraph three, and that's the most important one here, which says, but there are situations in which you cannot delete your data. Pay attention to this. This is very important. It's going to be part of the debate. Uh, and what does it say? Uh, it says, for exercising your freedom of expression, you can't do that if it contradicts the right to the freedom of expression, uh, for compliance with various legal obligations, for reasons of public interest in the area of public health, uh, for avoiding, uh, for uh, archiving purposes in the public interest and for scientific research. So basically, in, and, and this is law, you know, you can't delete this law now. This is a fait accompli in the European Union, so we're not arguing about this law shouldn't happen. What we are arguing about is whether this is uh, legitimate, this whole right, uh, whether it should be applied in the US in one form or another. And so by further background, what I want to tell you also that it's nothing new, it's not a new right, and it's been applied in various other areas of life. For example, in, in the UK where I come from, there is an act called the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act. Uh, which actually says that uh, a criminal record cannot be invoked after a certain period of time for reasons of insurance or employment. Um, in France, there was be, there's been such a law since 2010, Le Droit du Bli, and actually it was first mentioned by the French data protection supervisors uh, 40 years ago. And it actually, finally, it's already existed in some form in previous European legislation. Uh, the, the Data Protection Directive, there was Article 12 that mentioned in germ both the right to erasure and the fact that certain data can be deleted after a period of time, although it didn't call it the right to be forgotten. Why it's got so much into prominence was because of the Google case in 2014, uh, where, which was um, 
a legal case uh, brought into the European Court of Justice whereby uh, a Spanish lawyer that was bankrupt about, I can't remember, 10, 15 years previously, uh, demanded for his link from Google to be delinked uh, when his personal name was mentioned. And the court decided that the newspaper advertisement would not be deleted, just the link from the search engine. And Google started a whole roadshow around Europe and rose it to prominence, and that's how it became a very famous case. So that's the ante The next thing I want to tell you is that in, in Europe, as elsewhere in the world and in most constitutions, the right to privacy and the right to freedom of expression and to access to information are equal rights in the Charter of Fundamental Rights. It doesn't say that the right to privacy takes precedence over the right of freedom of expression. They are equal rights. Any legislation has to take account of them both and has to balance them. And I believe that this law does balance them, as did previous legislatures. But of course, in the end, the, the, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And there'll be cases in courts, and there's already some uh, case history to see how this works, because actually these rights have to apply at national level. And of course, it depends on the individual law in the country and on the attitudes of the judiciary and the government, how they are going to interpret and balance these two rights. But so far, there are a few case histories that prove that there are balance quite adequately. So that's my background legal, and I'm not a lawyer, so do forgive me if there is any errors there, but I'm, I'm an advocate. So I'm now going to bring forward my advocate bit. Uh, as, as you all know in this room, because you are here, we live in an age of unprecedented data mining and profiling and artificial intelligence and mach machine learning and so on. And there's enough evidence by now um, that profiles of people can be used to make major decisions about them, whether it is insurance, um, whether it is um, uh, lending money, whether you are a, a you know poor person that has to be that you can sell subprime mortgages to that eventually leads to major problems. There's a lot of evidence of this. Um, as I was coming here on the plane, there was a, an article in one of the UK national newspapers about local authorities in the UK, because they are so short of money, making use of artificial intelligence and machine learning in order to profile and target the families that are likely to, uh, um, you know, uh, neglect their children or abuse them because it is their duty to uh, look after those children. And so this kind of profiling gave them a very good um, way of cutting costs, not having caseworkers. That's happening in the UK where this law applies. It's also happening in the US. Um, there's been a book by Virginia Eubanks published recently where she investigated a uh, welfare situation in a poor and disadvantaged area, and she's got three major case history to show how the system actually is against the interest of the poor when you use this automated means and build enormous public databases with profiles of people. So uh, these people in the US don't have the means of actually accessing their data, seeing what is there about them, saying, delete this, and if you shared it with the police and the judiciary, please tell them to delete it. And I think the duty of Paul and Jamie and any advocate is to look into these practices and make sure that they defend those people as well. Finally, and that's my last point, I don't know how I am for time, I totally 
would support also uh, Paul's view that the evil ones, the ones that have caused harm to anybody in society should be brought to account. And if they, if they caused a lot of harm, they shouldn't be forgotten, they should be on the public record, and uh, justice should be implemented in their case as well, as in the case of the hearing that takes place now. Those people have a lot of money. They can go to dodgy uh, reputation companies and tell them, can you put us at the back of the Google search because, you know, people only look on the first page or the second page. Poor consumers, other people with problems, don't have this means. And therefore, such a law brings more balance and more justice to the system. And then you have people like Jamie and Paul that actually can help those people exercise their rights. This is why I think this is a good law. Over to you. consumer data. And he was going to decry the trend in these cases as one that we should resist. And, and, and I think we at Public Citizen would largely agree with his characterization of those cases. My guess is that Google would probably have a strong First Amendment argument against the application of the right to be forgotten to its search listings, even without regard to those cases. But really, as a consumer advocate, that's not my main concern. I've spent 41 years protecting the right of people to talk about other people that they want to talk about. You know, they're union leaders. I spent 25 years in that space uh, and their employers. Um, more recently, it's been in the online space. And the impact of the right to be forgotten on Google is the least of my concerns. To me, to the extent the right to be forgotten is applied to web pages that contain statements made about somebody else who wants those facts to be forgotten. And there's a sort of a funny play with the term your data in the way Anna characterizes this. For Anna's right to be forgotten law, a newspaper article about Brett Kavanaugh is his data because it talks about him. And to the extent that you apply, and of course he's a public figure and you can argue about whether it's a different standard for him, but it's an impingement on the free speech rights of someone who has chosen to speak about somebody else, whether it's Brett Kavanaugh or the small, a small business in their community. And the First Amendment protects the right to make truthful statements about others on matters of public concern, even the right to make false statements, even to make them carelessly or even intentionally if it doesn't meet the standards for defamation. And in the dispute between the person who wants to have speech about them forgotten. And the person who wants to speak about that, Google is just a stakeholder. Yet the process takes the defense of the free speech rights out of the hands of the speaker, who is best situated to defend it, and puts it in the hands of a party, the search engine, who has no real stake in keeping the speech up, and has little ability to defend it because they don't know the details. And that, it seems to me, makes no sense as a matter of public policy, and it defies the First Amendment protection for the rights of the speaker. For my clients, the kind of people I represent, as Anna concedes, access to the top of the Google's list of search results is the key way for them to call their grievances to the attention of the public. And the, you know, the internet is so vast. A consumer wants to criticize somebody and bring their concerns to the attention of a relevant audience. It's a practical matter. If their criticisms don't show up at the top of the Google search results when somebody puts in the name of the person, it might as well not be online at all. 
and the targets of the criticism know this. And so over the years, they've devised various legal strategies and claims to drive their critics out of the top search results. This fact is driven home by a couple of lines of cases that I've been doing over the last 20 years. For several years of my online free speech practice, one of the major issues was the use of trademark law to suppress access to online gripe sites or pages about the trademark holders on review sites. So meta tags and titles and keywords and domain names. The common theme of these cases is that the companies didn't want to see criticisms appear on the first page or their, even the first few pages of the Google search results. So what they sought to do was forbid the use of trademarks in the parts of the web pages that were given significant prominence in Google's search algorithm and, and page ranking algorithm. And their argument, much as Mark would have argued today if he were here, was we're not trying to suppress your speech in violation of the First Amendment. Oh no, we don't question your right to have a web page, but their legal strategy was designed to relegate that criticism to the bottom of the search results where nobody would see it. So we won that series of cases. Courts recognized that using trademark law to prevent my kind of client from calling public attention to their sites about trademark holders had the potential to violate their free speech rights. So second series of cases are what we call the fake litigation cases. And you're going to laugh, but this actually happened. So Google has long had a policy and the other search engines do as well, that if a court decides that a certain page contains false and defamatory material or is otherwise illegal, Google will actually voluntarily respond to a request for delisting from the individual. So taking advantage of that policy, a coterie of unethical SEO operators and lawyers devised a strategy of concocting fake consent orders even fake court orders to send to Google to obtain delistings. Now here's how the scam works. Person who's criticized online sues somebody. Plaintiff sues defendant. Piece of paper, plaintiff defendant. Then the plaintiff files a, and he claims the defendant defamed or otherwise violated rights. Plaintiff then files a consent order signed by the defendant in which the defendant admit, admits, yes, it was I who made the criticism what I said was false, and the defendant consents, consents to an order that the criticism be taken offline. And then the order says, if for some reason the page isn't taken offline, Google is asked to take the page out of the search listings. Though, in fact, defendant isn't the author of the page. In fact, it's somebody else, for hypothetically my client who posted the web page. Sometimes the defendant is somebody who posted a comment for the purpose of then claiming there's defamatory material on the page. Sometimes the defendant is entirely fictional and the signature on the consent order is a forgery. Judges love settlements. And sometimes they're not very curious about how they came about, so they often would sign these orders. Another variant, there's a series of news stories reporting a conflict between a plaintiff and a defendant. The defendant says some things about the plaintiff are, that are not very nice. The plaintiff sues the defendant, claiming defamation. To save the bother of defending these cases, the defendant admits that his statements were false, and the plaintiff says, I won't seek damages against you if you agree to this consent order. The consent order asks the news sources that covered the controversy to take them out of their search listings. The order then provides that the stories don't, don't come down, they ought to be removed from the Google search results. In fact, those who reported the stories had good reason to think that what the defendant said about the plaintiff was true. And there's actually perhaps no reason to believe the defendant's new concession of saying something that wasn't true. So the press decide they're going to leave these stories up. They think their stories are true and accurate. They decide as a matter of policy, as a matter of their free speech rights, that they're going to keep them in their archive. So what should Google do? For a period of time, Google was responding to these fake orders by delisting. More recently, recognizing the scam, they're much more careful in responding to them. Now what this series of cases tells me is that the plaintiff's effort to take these pages out of the Google search results is an effort to suppress the speech of the web page authors. 
and it is their free speech rights that have to be considered in juxtaposition to the claims of the person who wants the speech to be forgotten. And they need to have the ability to stand up for their right to speak. In a few of these litigation, fake litigation cases, the plaintiffs were a debt resolution company and its CEO, who'd been criticized on the Get Out of Debt Guy website, hosted by my client, Stephen Rohde. We intervened in one case after one of these final consent orders was entered in federal court in Rhode Island. We argued that because the order was aimed at Rhodey's website, getting several pages taken out of the search engines, which me meant that people wouldn't come to them and he wouldn't be able to make money for his website from advertising. The order affected Rhodey's free speech rights, and he had a right to be heard, we said, before the order was entered. The judge agreed. In fact, he was a little embarrassed. He was, had the decency to admit on the public record how embarrassed he was about being diddled. He agreed to have the order vacated. Now, were the right to be forgotten extended to the United States, the same procedural rights would likely apply. Those whose speech is under assault in a demand for delisting would have a similar right to be heard before the decision is made. The First Amendment would certainly protect the page owner against an unjustified, legally compelled decision to delist. So either the page owner would intervene in the legal proceeding, or it would seek a declaratory judgment of non-violation of the right to be forgotten. That seems to be pretty clear under the way our procedural law works in the United States. That is decidedly not the case under the European setup. Google has actually been forbidden from letting the owner of a web page that's the subject of a delisting request know about the request. Google has been forbidden to ask that author for information to consider in deciding whether to delist. In fact, although the person seeking delisting can appeal to the courts from a decision not to delist, the page author has no appeal. It's a one-way ratchet. Now, Google has been letting page authors know about delisting decisions so that they can at least ask Google to reconsider. But that practice is under fire. The Spanish Data Protection Authority has ruled that Google may not do this. That's a matter that's under appeal. I'd be interested to hear how Anna feels about that. This aspect of the right to be forgotten, to my mind, is highly problematic. Google is the least well-placed to judge the free speech interests that might support continued listing. And data from study after study of takedown regimes involving intermediaries shows a serious tendency toward over-removal. There's a great summary of this research on the Stanford Cyber Law blog you can look for. Empirical evidence, empirical evidence of over-removal by internet companies under internet liability laws. So I want to close by illustrating the way this plays out in the context of a dispute with the case of the psychodentist, Gordon Austin. So Gordon Austin was a dentist in Carrollton, Georgia, which is a small town 50 miles west of Atlanta. And in the mid-2000s, it came to light that he sometimes didn't administer sufficient anesthesia to his patients. And then he had a nasty way of keeping the patients in his chair from disturbing patients in his waiting area by calling out when they hurt. He would tell them to be quiet. And when they didn't, he would hit them with a dental tool until they were quiet. And he would do this to all his patients, including child patients. Now, Austin was well-connected locally. People were afraid to talk about him or go after him. But eventually, he was prosecuted for this process. And there was news coverage of the charges, a, a two-part series. He eventually pleaded guilty to claims of Medicare fraud avoiding conviction on the charges of the counts alleging cruelty to children, his dental license was suspended. Now let's fast forward to 2016. Austin wanted to have the media reports of this controversy taken offline. Actually, they actually were no longer on the news organization's website. He persuaded the Georgia Attorney General's office to remove the press release about the charges and resulting conviction from its website. My client, was an individual, an anonymous individual in the community who had posted a YouTube video that showed the old media reports about the charges. Austin wanted to get that page taken down. Now, it came about in the form of a lawsuit against my client as a Doe defendant. 
Under the First Amendment, he did not have a valid claim that TV stories accurately portrayed the charges. My investigating investigation suggested that the charges were true, or at least there was a significant basis, in fact, for the charges made in the video. But let's assume that instead of what happened, we have a delisting request to Google. What should Google do about these outdated accusations that never led to a conviction about those accusations? Is this a past claim that Austin has a right to have forgotten? And there are cases decided under the right to be forgotten in the European courts where he would prevail. As the Doe's lawyer, I was able to inquire in the community, and I learned that the likely agenda of this effort to take the videos offline was that Austin was hoping to get his license reinstated so he could go back to practicing dentistry. And my client didn't want Austin to get his license back. And if he did, he want, my client wanted to be sure that anybody considering using Austin was aware of his past. Now, if this had been the subject of a right to be forgotten takedown request to Google, that information would not have been available to Google. Google would have no way of obtaining that information. And making a decision without having that information to balance the free speech right against the privacy right would harm my client's free speech rights, and I think it would harm the interests of dental consumers in rural Georgia. So that's a serious flaw in the right to be forgotten, as it applies to web pages about matters of public concern. And it seems to me that if the right were to be made to apply in the United States, that problem would have to be addressed. I'm not, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I this on? I'm not a lawyer, and I can't speak. Play one on TV. I, I can't speak to a lot of the legal issues, but I was, uh, and I was a little surprised to be invited to be on this panel. But uh, I think it's because I actually objected to the TACD letter that was uh, made a reference to this issue. Okay. All right. Uh, well, uh, first thing, I'm just gonna go through some more practical issues. And for, first of all, I will concede that there are many compelling reasons why uh, privacy rights have, have a good effect. Um, and the proponents of the right to, to be forgotten often do a good job of presenting those and make people reflect on the cases when uh, uh, actually moving beyond someone's purse transgressions or political views or other things is a, is a good thing. But I'm, I'm not going to, I don't want to dispute that those things are true. What I want to do is talk about what I think are the, uh, the areas I've had where I think a legal right to be forgotten would be uh, a bad policy uh, for the reasons I think it would be. First, I think it's, it, the issue is not always about someone being a public figure like Judge Kavanaugh. Um, uh, recently, we had a, a, a person we hired to fix our front door. And we, we told another neighbor about it because another neighbor was, uh, you know, looking for a handy person, I guess. And then she, she asked the name and came back and said, you know, that person was, had, a, had a conviction for breaking and entering. Um, <laughs> we hadn't done the, the search, but she did. Uh, and I'm sure she used a search engine to, to track that down. Um, I used to live in Alaska uh, and later in, in graduate school, and I was witness to uh, some pretty severe spousal abuses uh, uh, issues where it, it would make me question just how I would feel. But those were personal issues. But, uh, you know, you, you meet someone, some of the people, they seem very nice. And then you eventually you learn maybe that something is not just a one-off, but maybe a pattern. Uh, those can be pretty devastating uh, in the cases I, I was aware of for some of the people involved. Um, I recently had an emergency automobile repair issue. Uh, and uh, after we sort of engaged the person, then I began to sort of pop up things on the internet that were disturbing to say the least. Um, I may have chosen a different route if I had, um, um, they were not related to uh, the quality of the auto repair we're gonna get, I'll just leave it at that. But, um, and I, I mention these cases because they're, they're, they're not cases where there would be some uh, obvious people monitoring, you know, whether these things were, being deleted from search engines. The person that was doing it would know why they were doing it, and other people would probably not follow it too much. Um, 
Uh, and I, I used to live in, uh, as I mentioned, Alaska. Uh, one time we were doing an investigation, and there was a uh, a person that was had an important job in the housing authority, uh, who had a who, who were investigating for corruption. And uh, at one point, that person conveyed a threat to have me uh, wrapped in a chain and thrown in the inlet. Uh, I guess to kill me. I guess. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, I was. At the time, I used to do a lot of work on corruption in government. And part of this involves sort of tracking down the history of people and some of their background. And uh, Alaska was a place famous for people for second chances. You'd sort of, you know, you'd start over in Alaska was one thing you, you sort of saw a lot. And some of the politicians there, there were some pretty uh, crazy backgrounds. So I used to investigate uh, potential links between um, labor unions and mafia figures and corruption of uh, labor union funds and things like that. And that was sort of painstaking work. But knowing the history, sometimes it was not obvious initially what an initial association that would link person A to person B might be. It maybe seemed kind of innocuous, but in the point of an investigation, these things can help really make you understand what the relationships are and who was involved and whether they knew each other or some things uh, that may have led to some financial considerations that would have been important. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I can say this was a, a fairly big part of my life. When I moved to Washington, D.C., um, one of the uh, or things I did, the first thing I did in international intellectual property is I, I was in Bariloche, Argentina, for a meeting on trips uh, before trips came into effect. That's where I met Carlos Correa and other people. And while I was there, they arrested a Nazi uh, in the town. They literally did it while I was there, a guy that had been living there. They, they, they arrested him, they tracked him down. And I remember the people in the community saying, well, that's really, um, he was such a nice guy. Why did they, do, why did they bring up all this all stuff? He was kind of a, a well-liked guy in, in Bariloche. But I can certainly understand the people that think that it is not just that he wasn't currently involved in uh, incinerating people or, uh, you know, uh, all the things that, the, you know, that, uh, that he was in trouble for um, in terms of his association with, uh, with uh, the Holocaust. Um, but that, uh, that they, they believe that sometimes for, it, it's a sanction going forward. Uh, even people that do criminal time, it's not just that you did the time and it's all over that's the whole sanction. In fact, sometimes the judge lets you out with a hope that you'll, you know, they don't see that it's, it's not always, society doesn't want to just lock people up forever. They can't afford it. It's not good. It's, it's not good. You want people to kind of move on. But uh, particularly for a lot of white collar crimes, the fact that you did it uh, uh, and it's out there for a while protects other people that may want to do business with you. And it also is an additional sanction uh, uh, for things that sometimes is as important as whatever jail time people may do or whatever fines people may pay. Um, I'll give you some completely different examples. Uh, we, we, there were some big debates about patent transparency. There was a couple of academics that were, had made some presentation uh, to, uh, to a big forum at, 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 at White in Geneva uh, claiming that, that uh, health groups like MSF or our group, Oxfam, and groups like that didn't care about patent transparency. Only, only they did and only... Uh, uh, and, and, and we were just, you know, I don't know, hated capitalism or whatever it was. It was just kind of some weird rant. So I put together a list, which is on our web page, of about, you know, about 50 different data points of the work that groups like MSF and other groups uh, many, and other academics, other people have been pushing for on patent uh, transparency over a period of 20 years. And then I was later contacted by one of the authors because he, he he'd sort of changed his job. And he said, can you take that down? And I said, well, <laughs> and did we get anything wrong? You know, because we sort of criticized the author's presentation and rebutted it. And he said, when people search for my name, it's the first thing that pops up. And I said, okay, well, are you willing to criticize the paper at all? You know, and admit that there was a mistake or, you know, correct the record or something like that or put, you know, deal with a perspective that... And he said, you think about it, but that never happened, right? So we, you know, we still have the page up, right? But it was, I understand his point of view, but yeah, I want you to understand our point of view on that. Um, 
when we had a, 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 one time I was invited to go to Beijing by the Chinese government for a, a conference that was Beijing and the European Union. And um, uh, it was on access to medicine and things like that. And the European Commission blocked my way, even though the Chinese government was willing to pay my way. It was a joint, a joint meeting. And the European Union told the Chinese government, when the Chinese government offered to pay my way, they said, you don't understand, Mr. Love will not appear at this conference. And I later followed up with a trade official to find out what happened. And, and his complaint was that I had identified him personally, this was a bureaucrat in the commission, for things he'd done to limit the scope of disease, to you know, only AIDS and malaria and other things, and you know, all these different things he'd done to hurt poor people in developing countries. And he said his neighbors ran across this stuff because he wasn't super well known. But there on our, you know, on our list of our blogs with this story about, you know, his, his, he was personally named. He said, "I'm just doing my job." You know, it's like <laughs> it's a little bit like you can imagine the, the analogies I can draw here. But uh, we, we, to us, the ability to name. A person that's executing a policy is an important sanction that we have to make people be more, to give some pushback to some of the orders they get. You know, they're just too compliant sometimes, and they can mean the death and suffering of very vulnerable populations. And we want the ability to do that. Very similar when we're working on Treaty for the Blind, we had a page where we listed the people that opposed the Treaty for the Blind, and we have their photographs and what they did to oppose the Treaty for the Blind. And for the really famous person, like the head of Disney, it doesn't really have a huge impact. He doesn't really care. But uh, there were other people that were less famous that were really, really, really unhappy about being on that page and having their photograph up there. But, you know, I mean, I don't care if you need a job, you want to feed your family. Taking a job to stop a treaty on copyright exceptions for people who are blind, the primary de beneficiaries are blind people living in developing countries. I just don't have much sympathy if that's how you choose to make your money. I think that people have a right to know that's who you are. Um, but believe me, uh, as, far as, as far as I know, that, that may even be blocked you know, from a database in Europe because that person was most incensed to this was, uh, was living in Europe, or maybe they'll seek that. Um, Mark Kavanaugh, uh, patient group shells, the Russia investigation. A lot of the Russian investigation are, are just coming into relief right now. People are trying to figure out all these sort of fake news, manipulating elections and Brexit and all these sort of things in, in Eastern Europe, in the US, all these connections between all these groups. You could not have the foresight to know what the public interest was in these types of information. And I was told by someone in this thing that if you have access to physical copies of things, you don't need the you know things to be in database and index. Well, that just is crazy. We tried once to sort of rebut the decision that you didn't need access to court cases on the internet because you could go to the judge, you could go to the court itself and plow through their archives and get a physical copy of a court decision. And we actually sent someone out to the archives in, 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 in you know in Maryland to try and do that to figure out how, how expensive and complicated it was. It was it was ridiculous. So these are really key things, and that's why. Uh, we opposed uh, uh, any, any action by the Transatlantic Consumer Dialogue to endorse the right to be forgotten. Thank you. I think you are both fantastic people and do an amazing job. And I don't disagree to any of the points you made in your presentations. I just want to bring out three things. Um, Paul, um, <coughs> you concentrated a lot on litigation. Uh, yes, you, you've given us a lot of examples of bad people trying to disguise their record and the, the litigation job that had to be done in order to restore their bad records. Am I right? That, I mean, that's how I interpreted what you said. And, and I totally agree that what you did was fantastic. My argument here is that the majority of, and, and let's leave search engines uh, aside from this, because the, the right in European law is much wider than delisting from Google. 
It's about any human being that has an inaccurate record and, and, and it's inaccurate and false and disparaging. You know, think about Madison Com and all those people whose uh, information has been put out there on the net and quite a few of them committed suicide because of their reputations being uh, ruined and lots of other examples like that. So, you know, in, in places like Europe, there's no litigation culture. Um, even NGOs like us, when we know the situation, uh, it would be too expensive for us to take cases to court. So having a writing law that balances the public interest with the right of a private person to get redemption, as most people re deserve to, in my view, is a good thing. So that's one point, litigation. Uh, the second point I want to make is corporations. You mentioned a lot Google decisions about delisting. I totally agree with you. I do not like corporations making decisions about this. This is the cases that should be brought to a, an independent authority in the first place and, uh, if necessary, taken to a, a neutral court of justice. Um, having Google as the ju judge and jury is not a really great thing in my view at all. So I would agree with that entirely. Um, Jamie, you mentioned government. You mentioned China. Totally agree with you. To have an effective law like this, you need an independent judiciary and you need democratic governments. In the wrong hands, it could be a weapon of truth and uh, getting justice. So, so in this respect, I, was, I would totally agree that you need to have a right like this in law in a jurisdiction where freedom of speech and freedom of the press and the media is totally protected. So I don't disagree with you on that at all. My point that I made at the beginning is that the law as it stands now addresses all the, uh, all the uh, worries that you have about such a right in law, certainly in our part of the pond. Uh, you know, I'm not even trying to influence how you see things in the US. But I'm arguing that for our side of the pond, this is a good thing, providing it's implemented in the right way and by the right judiciary and governments. And so far, there are case histories. For example, uh, even before this law appeared, I read about a case history in Poland, which has its own problems with the judiciary, um, where um, there, was a, there was a case uh, where uh, the complainant demanded to remove, remove a press article from, a, uh, from an archive of the press which gave the wrong information about him and the, uh, and the court decided not to remove the article because that was against the freedom of the press but to put a, a, a notice on the article saying that uh, actually, this case has been resolved and the defendant has been acquitted or something like that. So that was an explanation, but the article and the link was never removed. Um, and, and there are lots of other examples like this. So anyway, I rest my case. No, no that's not that's, uh, <laughs> We've gone long. So um, we'll skip the conversation that I was going to sort of moderate. And let's take advantage of the fact that the Americans left the room and we have an international audience. And you all think we're lunatics with the cult of the First Amendment, and uh, which has got some fair rationale to it. And just let's have the conversation. We'll go about 30 minutes. We have microphones and, and two um, <coughs> folks here from AU who will bring you the microphone. You know, with a norm. Like, you all have important things to say, but nonetheless try to limit what you're saying anyway. Um, so we can get through the conversation. We'll do this for about half an hour, and then we'll wrap up with two minutes each for the, the three panelists. Yeah, you've been so expressive throughout. You should go first. Uh, 
practice law and in Uganda. So I do have some advantages there. Um, add a few points because I'm also moving that spectrum from curriculum adding and So I think um, we can stop pretending that uh, the conditions which led to Section 200 Act or various other laws which give exemption to intermediaries or platform companies uh, exist now. Those conditions were very different. They are no longer neutral uh, intermediaries. The role has expanded to quite a large extent. Um, the current, uh, uh, now because it happened in the U.S., everybody's just paying attention because it's been happening for quite a while in the rest of the world. But the election interference world and what happens otherwise uh, tells us that these platforms are no longer uh, able to fit into one small category. They are much larger, and now they're also at times publishers without the responsibility of the publisher with the they are sometimes advertisers. And the amount of data which gets uploaded, they are by default becoming the arbiters of truth. It's all well and great to say, and I love it as a lawyer, that rule of law should apply in every case in every courts, and we should have something which will explain to us what is the best practice. That just doesn't happen because um, we see how, how much data gets posted. Um, I do also want to say is that Companies hate it because this means adding more resources dedicated to this work. But this group definitely knows that Hollywood does have a lot of scope. They can do it for copyright. They can definitely do for a lot of other categories. Um, and uh, privacy. And I think one of the major distinction is how we understand rights to privacy in the US as well as uh, and other places whether it's the European or the status of UK. Uh, but uh, it's, it's this thing about sectoral privacy here, this desire that self-regulation for us. That's why everybody was just in California attempt for any privacy legislation. They want self-regulated federal legislation to give them both power. This understanding really helps us uh, to get a little deeper into why these First Amendment rights are made, are, are arguments are made, right to privacy ones from the other side. Many other countries, including India, now have some form of right to be forgotten in terms of proposed legislation. They do have the safeguards, which we are all worried about. I love all this anecdotal data, uh, but that's anecdotal data or one or two cases. I would like to see the 43% of 2.4 million requests which Google says it has made. They give transparency substance. I really do not know that we're talking here big data. We're talking about arguments which we love as lawyers. It's not, it's not no longer as bind to the First Amendment where we are protecting it. So I, just asking more questions at, uh, with all these other than what the people Sorry for hogging this. That's great. Let's, let's actually do a couple more uh, so we can get more views on the floor. That's fine. Yeah, go ahead. Hi. Uh, <coughs> thanks. That was a great conversation. And uh, I still don't know where I stand on this myself. But a uh, question for uh, Paul and Jamie. Um, so uh, actually com carrying on from the point about data. I think most criminal justice systems and legal systems in general see uh, vulnerable and minorities uh, punished more by the system or exploited more. So uh, when you're talking about actors and um, how they're affected by the right to be forgotten down the line, uh, I mean, it's important to keep in mind that, let's say, in US, African Americans will have less luck in getting the justice system because they'll have less uh, willingness or ability to engage with the laws that uh, allow this. And similarly, um, they're also more likely to be 
to have records that need that they would like to uh, be deleted down the line because of the criminal justice system and how it uh, pushes them down, so to speak. And this is probably similar in most countries of the world. So just uh, thoughts on that. That's great. One more question or comment. Your neighbors. We'll get to you. Uh, thank, thank you to all the panelists. Uh, my question is quite you know, sort of fundamental. And if we just go back to the time when uh, GDPR was about to be implemented, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, was it always right to erase it, or was it actually right to, for to be forgotten? Because I see there is a difference between right to be forgotten and right to erase it. And there is a difference because possibly right to be forgotten may not be attained to the extent as it was hoped. Just a quick. That's great. Why don't we go um, down the line and answer as much as you can, but try to be as crisp as you can so we can I'll get more questions. I'll be two seconds. Uh, just to answer your last question, Paul, uh, first GDPR. Um, originally, uh, this uh, in the in the first draft of GDPR, this right to be uh, forgotten was there to take care of children that put um, things on Facebook that they would regret ten or twelve years later when they applied for employment. And actually, the recital still still refers specifically for that. Um, and in the course of all the 5,000 amendments and debate. But there are two clear distinctions, as I show in Article 1, is about erasing, and Article 2 is the so-called right to be forgotten. Quick comment to, to the lady in a beautiful suit. Um, <laughs> sorry, I didn't remember your name. I, 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 totally, um, I, to I totally see your point, well, two points you've made, that the intermediaries are not, no longer neutral. This is, you know, the whole Cambridge Analytica scandal and everything else demonstrates this. Um, the, the, I think there's been court judgments whereby uh, Google has claimed that they, are, they should have the same defense as, a, as the media. That's what you were referring to. And, and the judgment was, no, they're not. They're not the media. They're not because they don't generate their own stuff. They just provide other, but they're no longer neutral. This is why I object to them making um, decisions. I, d I don't think they're the right platforms to make judgments that are not transparent and don't show us how they make those judgments. Um, and your uh, point about vulnerability, that was the key of my argument that this right is more important for the vulnerable than it is for the corrupt, because the corrupt have other means and money to do it, but the vulnerable don't. So, a few things. Um, transparency. As somebody who is trying to understand the way the system works in Europe, of course, I don't do European law, I do US law. I would love to know the details about the right, the delisting requests that Google receives. Google has actually been forbidden by the European Data Protection Authority from disclosing these details because the concern is that would have hurt the ability of the people who made the request to be forgotten. And you know, you can understand that concern, but the problem is, I mean, the lack of transparency they do numerical transparency reports because, as I understand it, they're forbidden from doing anything else. They provided descriptions of a number of cases in very vague terms. On the other hand, the media sites in Europe, I mean, talk about protecting the media and their rights. The media, both in Europe and in the United States, are greatly concerned about the right to be forgotten, quote unquote, as an impingement on their rights as journalists. If you can look on the BBC's website, you can look at on the Telegraph's website for a listing of the situations in the, which they've been required to delist. And it's really quite staggering. You can take a look at the brief that 24 media organizations from the United States filed in the recent global delisting case, the Google.com case, in which they decried this right as a serious infringement of their rights as journalists to make their speech available to the public. 
not to speak of their ability as journalists to conduct investigations in the way that Jamie was speaking. Um, I think we have to distinguish between delisting records of government. We have no, I have no problem with applying a right to be forgotten. Probably goes state by state the way our jurisdictions work, although I I'm not sure you could have a federal law requiring states to delete records. Interesting question, I think, as a, ma a matter of sort of congressional power and federalism. Uh, the right of children to have the stuff they put up on Facebook, that's not what we're talking about here. That right, plainly, the right of er to erase the data that you yourself have put up, I have no problem with that. It's the ability to erase things that other people have said about you, which implicates their First Amendment right. And you know, Anna speaks about, she doesn't want it to be litigated yet on the, on the one hand, but she wants it to be in before an administrative agency. Well, that sounds like litigation to me. Um, and we, in American law, strikes a balance between the right to protect your reputation and the right of free speech by very severely restricting the ability to bring claims based on reputation when the statements are about matters of uh, public concern and that those are cases decided under the First Amendment under New York Times v. Sullivan and its progeny. So yes, we have a balance and we strike it in favor of free speech. Uh, in Europe, you don't have to do that and you are entitled to do it that way. Go ahead, disagree. without balancing the freedom of expression or others, or right to information also, which is now there. I think that's why it goes a little further, and it's no longer about that, oh, people are They're recognizing all of this. I, I'm not, and the, the that's first- That's what you say, but no, that's not what the press in, that's not what the no, press in Europe think. No, I'm, I'm sorry. You, it, you stand up as the defenders of the press, that's not what they think. Just, Persuade them otherwise. Yeah. Okay. Let, let's 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 let Jamie go, and then we're gonna go with some more comments. No, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. No, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I, I was just going to respond to the question, the question that was asked uh, uh, about the asymmetry of uh, the ability to take advantage of the right to be erased or right to be forgotten, which requires a, a degree of sophistication, uh, uh, in some cases maybe even legal assistance, um, versus the uh, disproportionate effect of the criminal justice system, for example, um, on, um, on uh, uh, people of color, for example, in the United States. Well, um, uh, I think uh, w my guess is that the, the right to be taken out of the database will be primarily exploited by people that are, uh, that are well, well educated and have uh, access to good technical background and in some cases legal representation. Uh, I, I think those would be the pri primary beneficiaries. I, uh, but I could be wrong. I mean, you know, we'll have to wait and sort of see how this uh, this plays out. Um, um, right. I, I used to work for a, pri a private consulting firm, and um, uh, we we were. My client was uh, one of my clients was Shell uh, Pension Fund, and the the guy running the pension fund at the time was famous for hiring private investigators. Uh, when he was working on a deal to investigate the backgrounds of the people uh, he was dealing with. Those were really expensive, uh, but you know, he, he could do it. Uh, what, what happens when you sort of take out of the public domain version of information of tracking and sort of finding things, you, you still have another class of people that are wealthy and have access to wealthy resources that, that have access to private databases and things like that are going to be less affected by this or will defend their rights in ways that really make it 
problematic for it to be used in the same way that the Google, for example, thing works. Because they're not public databases, they're not on the web, they're not as vulnerable like that. So I think that uh, uh, it's important to pay attention to the asymmetries, not only who is likely to benefit, but also all of the policies, like Paul mentioned, like the, the, the lack of transparency in the way that Google's, uh, you know, no one really knows exactly how it's going to. We're in an area right now where it's a critical moment about fake news, being able to verify things and stuff like that. And anything that makes it harder to verify things and, um, and erases things which are factually true and probably relevant for various things should be really cautious about, I think. So you guys are doing a great job of testing my moderator skills. And I will, uh, one thing I'll do is not offer any editorial comments, although I have a lot now because this is a provocative conversation. So Anna can't stand it. She's got to say one thing. And then Anna's going to say one thing. And then no, since no, you, no, oh, no, I, well, we're, Anna, I, I shamed her, so that's good. And so she's done. Anna is uh, a hate hog. Stop. Uh, so you have, you're holding the mic? Or did they take it away from you? Oh, that's a, that's a good volunteer who's taking the mic away. Yeah, she took. Uh, so we'll go you, and then you, and then you, and then eh, we'll throw you in there too. We'll do three men in a row. And then we're going to pause, and that may be it. And then we'll try to close up. We, we are constrained on time. Um, so she's first, and then back here, here, and here. Just had a very quick remark. Uh, I mean, uh, jumped into that doing it for such a long time. Uh, I think one thing that is hitting the most right to erasure is I think it's sadly dubbed as the right to be forgotten. I quite agree with Anna on that. Um, this is about justice, and the gist of the article is to help those who have been injustice by wrong information. But I understand the opponent's point of view as well. But I think nobody here, including Anna, has been advocating the right of offenders, criminals, uh, using right to erasure to have information erased. And the article itself, maybe I'm a very simple European lawyer, but it comes, maybe I'm not as bright as our uh, US um, opponent, but the right itself is clear. It comes with an exception clause, which is 17.3, right behind Anna. And there is the freedom of expression exemption. So my understanding, and uh, as far as Google's Spain case goes, when we have the right to be forgotten and freedom of expression, actually weight is, in most of the cases, is to be given to freedom of expression. This right cannot be used to oppress uh, rights of victims, and this right cannot be used uh, to help offenders, criminals, etc. And I think um, one thing to be um, GDPR is fairly new. And I think it's uh, at this point quite uh, quite early to jump into conclusions as to the effectiveness of the right. We, I think, need to see a few cases. As you mentioned, Google, due to legal reasons, cannot comment on uh, details of these. But as I said, I mean, let's not jump into conclusions very quickly because. We're talking about GDPR, which only came into force in May. So I think we need to live and see, and perhaps maybe in a year or two, we can have the same panel and see whether the right has been working or what are the goals of the right. Thank you very much. No, no, no. I have a key. You're, you're passing? Okay, cool. People who want to pass, we you get bonus points. <laughs> you get a pass to pass. Uh, I'll be really fast because she actually uh, said a lot of what I wanted to say. Um, I I think I I thought I I came in with I thought a pretty good understanding of what those carve outs for freedom of expression and public interest mean. Um, I have a much less clear idea of what they mean now as a, as a, as a simple American and a member of the cult of the First Amendment. Um, so I'd, I'd love to hear, like, 
an example or two of a takedown that clearly should or should not uh, fall into that carve out. What about the murder, uh, the murder case? You know, the the person that wanted it uh, Dear wife. didn't want any reporting of the fact that he was convicted of murder. I mean, to me, that the idea that he'd somehow did his time, and so nobody should know he murdered somebody. I don't know. I, I, I had a, I have a relative that was in my, highly suspected in our family to have been murdered by someone. She she died at a very early death. At, pre, Almost immediately, um, um, uh, you know, the, not, not where you bury the person, but where you, you know, you, you burn them up, right? And um, the guy had insured her shortly before she, her demise. And, 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 you know, we found out later that he had a, a benefit from a similar arrangement <laughs> previously, you know. I, I, I just think, you know, th these, are, these are things that are, are not necessarily best forgotten necessarily. Sometimes. Go ahead. Um, thanks for the presentation, hold everyone. On, 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 I'm just saying, Paul knows the uh, the site on the, uh, the 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 murder case. It was what what country was that, Anna? Sorry. That where, where was the murder case? Was what country was that? Was that Finland where that case was done? It's recent, right? Uh, Let, let's pause, let's pause on the murder because we're we're at on time. Okay. Let's uh, want to case. thank you everyone for the presentation. I am a Brazilian constitutional law teacher. And this is the theme of my thesis, so I'm very interested. In, I was very interested in hearing what you had to say. And uh, when I bring this theme to my students, the classroom goes crazy because it's a very debatable uh, thing. And uh, the first uh, point I want to make is that there's, I don't think there's a singular notion about right to be forgotten. There are a lot of right to be forgotten inside one. There's the right to the list. There's the right to erase criminal records. There's the right to erase... Uh, regarding to privacy, and I think the people need to limit better what they are talking about when they talk about this subject. And um, in Brazil, we just passed a new law regarding uh, data protection. It's like it's passed a month ago, and we decided not to talk on it about the right to be forgotten. We decided to trust judges on the subject. Uh, I want to hear uh, your opinion about it because we use a lot of Ronald Dworkin's theory about weighting principles and that kind of stuff. So we trust that judges will do the right thing when they uh, balance principles like freedom of speech, freedom of, freedom of expression, and privacy. That's my first question. Uh, the second one is, uh, is it really possible to think to be for or against the right to be forgotten in an abstract way? Because I think it's more like a case-based Case-based thing, you can't be like I'm for or I'm against the right to be forgotten without knowing the particularities of each case, and um, especially because in constitutional law we learned that principles they don't have like uh, there's not a principle that's higher than the other in the abstract point of view. It all depends how you use it in the in each case. So these are my two main questions, and I would like to. Uh, thank everyone for a brilliant presentation. Okay, so we'll get the last question, then we're going to wind up. Sorry, th thank you for, for the opportunity. Um, very quickly, I'm sorry if I'm harsh with my words, but I really think reading these exceptions to right to be forgotten as great protection uh, from freedom of expression is pretty naive. Basically, on, on empirical uh, uh, instances. For example, in Mexico, the one case of right to be forgotten that was applied was uh, an entrepreneur said, there's this article that uh, talks about corruption. I want to take it down. Goes to the data protection authority, gets the order to Google to delist. And I mean, this type of balancing would be have to be done by Google. But the problem is, as Paul mentioned, that's not the only stakeholder in, in, in this problem. It was the, the media organization that published that article that is the one that is affected, and the public, inter, the public general, uh, the general public in, in general. But they, will, they never knew that this, this happened. So this, they were not able to use and to impose these restrictions. It, 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 this is just 
uh, words in, on paper. In, in reality, if those that are affected with their freedom of, free, freedom of expression rights by the listing decisions don't even know that they're being affected, they cannot, they cannot make these exceptions uh, go to courts, etc. The, the one case that we know is because of a fluke. We were able to, to know, and I personally let the media organization know, like, hey, do you know that the Data Protection Authority just made a decision that is going to the list a website about your, your newspaper? And they say, oh, I didn't know. And we were able to litigate that, and we won, basically, on procedural rights. Because we were not part, they were not part of the decision that this article says that Google has to make. And it's exactly as Paul said, uh, the Data Protection Authority of Spain is saying, Google cannot tell you that you are being affected by a right to be forgotten case. So there's no way for these exceptions to be enforced by those that are affected in the freedom of expression. So it's really, really, I mean, if you want to wait it out, this is not new. This didn't exist with the DPR. This has been pushed for years, and there's empirical cases that show how this is abused. So my question is just, I need to react to this. But my question is, I don't, I don't think we will ever, I, I, I really for years tried to understand the position, the European position, and I heard all the articles, I read everything, you won't convince me. And, and there's no way this is compatible with constitutional law in Mexico, with inter-American human rights law, we, it's, it's impossible. So would you at least accept that you shouldn't impose this, uh, this uh, figure to the rest of the world, for example, with the global removal cases? Uh, would you accept that if you want to have right of forgotten in Europe, that's your problem, but stop <laughs> imposing <laughs> that on the rest of on the world? And, and particularly the decision of the, of the tribunal, U European oh. Union, about giving global uh, uh, reach to those decisions is wrong. And you can have your right to be forgotten, and we can have a right to truth, because there's constitutional, <laughs> legal, political, social reasons why this is very conflictive for Latin America. So that's what my, my opinion and my question. Uh, hold on. OK, no, no apologies for your, your, your passion, which is awesome, and, uh, and an insightful intervention. So let, hold, hold on, hold on. So <laughs> you guys. So the, these are the two volunteers. I don't know your names, but thank you so much for being here. I said, look, we don't need your help on the timing, but, but now we do. Okay, so they're each going to get three minutes, and then you should like get in their face and like really shame them when they go like too much. Wave it so they know, and then shame them when they go too long because we have to we have to manage it. And then I will. Um, this is going to be a wrap up. Three minutes each. That's it. Answer the questions and the wrap and 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 your your concluding brilliant statements. And um, my uh, prerogative as as the moderator is just to to thank you. So obviously, yes, it's a huge thing. Your, your, your comments you all have. You're bringing huge amounts of information and knowledge to the to the conversation, which is awesome and super appreciated. It is absolutely correct. We're just debating simultaneously abstract principles and concrete application, and we have data, but we're disputing what the data is. We didn't even dispute the, debate, the terms of the debate. That's part of what I think this conversation is, and one of the reasons we wanted to have the conversation here. So all those things are correct. Those are correct criticisms, but they're kind of not really wrong. They're just kind of part of what we're trying to do. And thank you all for a really informed conversation. It would be great if we could go three more hours, but we can't. We will start with Jamie, and we'll go this way, um, three minutes. Don't just stay over there. Come to the front, so you can, like, and then stand up when they're going too far. Like, make them feel really bad and stuff. <laughs> Use a dental tool to make us quiet. <laughs> it's not easy to silence these people. And then I'll start singing, which will definitely shut the room down. <laughs> Jamie, you're first. Uh, I just want to give the site on the, uh, the murder case. It was in Finland. Uh, the person had been convicted. Um, uh, but was sentenced for, for uh, diminished responsibility for murder because of, uh, um, of a health condition, uh, and uh, which was not public. But basically, this person was convicted of murder, did their time, was released in July 2017, and they asked that they, and Google was, was, is now required to take down any reference to his murder conviction. So that was just the citation on that case. Um, I'm almost done with my time, right? So now you still, you're still. She didn't even put up your two-minute thing, guys. You're, you're good. <laughs> I can. All right. Okay. Well. Um, you get two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't. You, we have no extra time. You can't. I, the chair has no time to give. Just don't interrupt. Go. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, I, I mean, 
there are always compelling reasons for, for privacy and, um, and secrecy as well. And so the balance has to be, do you tolerate the rough edges of, of, of transparency and sunshine and things like that, uh, knowing, knowing that it causes, it, it causes some damage? And I think you just have to decide where you play out. I, I, in this day and age, I think that being able to verify things, being able to investigate things, having everybody having uh, the same access that the powerful uh, have are good things personally for where we are right now in society. And I think it's, uh, uh, it's highly problematic some, uh, some of the directions that things are going on in Europe. Thank you. So, Boy, you model such good behavior. Try to follow that example. Yeah, so the topic for today is should the right to be forgotten be extended to the United States? And it seems to me the point that you made that it's too early to judge how it's playing out in Europe is really an argument for a resounding no to the question of whether it should be applied to the United States because if we don't know how it's working even in Europe, we shouldn't adopt it to, for the, in the United States until we see how it's playing out. We do actually have the example of how it's played out over, over the past four years. There's an excellent article by Don Nunziato uh, in 39 University of Pennsylvania International Law, I don't know, Review or Journal, 1, 2018. One of the things she does is talk about four cases in which the right to be forgotten has been applied to directly restrict the rights to enter orders directed toward media entities telling them what they have to put robots.tx on their sites for what they have to exclude from their uh, own archival search engines, or indeed what they can themselves publish. Uh, I would look at those cases as examples of ways in which I think the right to be forgotten is re really not working very well for the right of free speech uh, in Europe. Um, I think my main point about the way in which it could apply in the United States if it were to apply in the United States is the due process point that the gentleman on the left-hand side of the room made. You have to have the speakers at the table because it's really their rights that are at stake. Finally, to the point about shouldn't we just let judges decide each case on its individual merits, I think what you have to worry about is the transaction costs. It's expensive to litigate. It's expensive for the free speech person to stand up. It's also potentially expensive for the person who wants the right to be forgotten to be exercised. And it, of course, it imposes uh, costs on the tribunal. Uh, there are disadvantages to Cadi justice as well as advantages to it. Okay, my three minutes. Thank you. Um, I want to thank people in the audience for some amazing remarks made and, and everybody who's spoken has made some really strong points. So first of all, I agree with the person who said that it shouldn't be called the right to be forgotten. Uh, it's a right to erasure and I think this uh, message that was promoted by Google in the, 1940, in the 2014 after the judgment uh, has completely distorted the conversation. Um, I agree with uh, the ISUM and the other lady that it is a new law, it's very nuanced, it takes account of a number of things, and particularly I want to emphasize that freedom of speech is equally dear to the Europeans as it is to the Americans. Um, that, uh, and, and I myself come from Romania, so I know what that means, okay? Um, finally, I just want to end up with a quote that plays uh, to the comments made about the rights of victims, because we've mostly talked about those that are corrupted. And I'm just quoting from this book that I cited before, and I invite you all to read because it is incredibly important. Virginia Eubanks, it's called Automating Disadvantage or Automating Inequality. And she says, she calls it the digital powerhouse, poorhouse. The digital poorhouse is eternal. It promises an eternal record. Past decisions that hurt others should have consequences. 
but being followed for life by a mental health diagnosis, an accusation of child neglect, neglect or a criminal record diminishes life chances, limits autonomy, and damages self-determination. The eternal record is punishment and retribution, not justice. And I rest my case. If this, uh, if, you, if, if this is reflective of what this, uh, I, uh, this Congress is going to be about, you guys are you're in for a treat, and it's because you're creating such a, an exceptional conversation. Thank you all very much, and thank my three friends. Are we going to Mark? We miss you. Are we going to Photoshop him in? <laughs> <laughs> are we going to put no, him on the No, we're going to put him in the Mark, Mark, we forgot yeah, you're back. Yeah, we are not going to Was it okay? Cool. Did I, did I stamp my corner against Of course, of course. So you practice in New York, but you do an inter you have an international practice, is that it? With a firm? At the, what's that mean? Could mean anything, right? <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. Not the hardware freedom, the software freedom. Because there's another, there's a hardware, there's a hardware freedom thing that's kind of recently started too that I saw. Michael Weinberg or something. Yes, yes. Uh huh. Okay. Right. Uh huh. Right. I mean, there's protection for freedom of expression in theory. The question is how it works in practice. And, you know, because of the lack of transparency, we don't, we can't say for sure. But I think you can look at the listing of articles that the Telegraph, I mean, they, they actually provide the audit, a link to the article. And then they describe the circumstances. There's a lot of circumstances for, where it's hard to understand how the journalists write to talk about the situation that have been surrounded.